Well, good day, everyone. Uh, or should I say good day? Uh, I'm calling uh, from here in London, and we have on the other end of the line uh, Dr. Rachel Ann Carter, the Director of Cyber at the Geneva Association, who's based at the moment in Melbourne. You might think she should be on a mountaintop in Switzerland, but uh, during lockdown, uh, she, she's uh, gone home to Melbourne. And so we really are spanning the world today. And we're going to be talking, therefore, about worldwide topics, war, terrorism, and hostile cyber activity, consensus and clarity within the cyber frontier. And the cyber frontier has, I think, bedeviled all of us over these last uh, many decades, but most particularly in the last two decades with the rise of the Internet. And uh, now that more weight is being placed on the cyber world, uh, naturally that cyber world is an area of increasing conflict. Now, you know me, I'm Michael Minelli, one of the directors of Zien, and it really is a privilege to be able to introduce so many of these webinars, but we can only do so because of the tolerance, as I'd like to point out, the tolerance and expansiveness of our sponsors who allow us to range widely and freely across technology, economics, and finance. And of course, today is certainly a subject touching on all three, coming from a technical area, looking at many of the insurance and finance aspects of it, and recognizing very clearly that the global economy depends on the cyber functioning. And Rachel has been doing some very, very deep research in this space, which she'll share with us in a moment. So just a small reminder on the format. My job is to get out of the way as quickly as possible so you can hear from our expert. Uh, the recording will be up in approximately 48 hours if you wish to share it with friends or colleagues or, or uh, review it. The slides are already up and in the chat area as well as posted on the website. And so all of the obvious questions I, I hope are out of the way. However, uh, we will be having a 20 minute Q&A session at the end where Rachel has kindly agreed to get into a conversation with me. And I'd like you to please type your questions, uh, comments, observations into the GoToWebinar question and chat facility on your screen. There's no point in emailing me, texting me, signaling me, WhatsApping me. I'm here with you, and I'll only catch those afterwards. So please do send things through the chat room. And when you do so, we will make sure that Rachel gets every one of those with your email attached. So if you just want to say hi or connect, simply type that in as well, and we will ensure uh, that she gets that. So with no more ado uh, and getting straight into the meat of things, Rachel, the floor is very much yours. Excellent. Thank you, Michael. So thank you for everyone that's online listening. Next slide, please, Michael. Think back to last year at the start of the global pandemic. Well, in fact, the pandemic we're still in. The spread of COVID-19 was an acute reminder that the globalized world became connected to a point where an obscure biological virus from a single source rapidly triggered economic and cultural disruption that hasn't been witnessed since the Second World War. In April 2020, the FBI reported a 300% increase in cyber incidents alone. Amongst the spike in cyber activity, there has been a probable increase of cyber activity, which has involved at least to a large degree, organized groups such as cyber terrorism, terrorism, sorry, cyber terrorists rather, or cyber adv adversaries with links to a state. The challenge was thus laid out to the insurance industry to better understand collectively what risks we face at present and the probable future risks which arise from cyber terrorism, hostile cyber activity and cyber war. And equipped with this knowledge, how we as an industry make better decisions about underwriting to ensure that coverage for these kind of risks remain fit for purpose and continue to grow in a sustainable man manner. In looking laterally at these issues, the challenge for ensuring cyber terrorism, hostile cyber activity depend on the industry's ability to do the five following things. One, acute accurately and clearly articulate the risks and any parameters or, or limits on the coverage that's available to stakeholders. Two, identify responsible the responsible actor or the type of actor, whether they're a terrorist, a state actor, a criminal or other. Three, discern the type of attack and whether it was cyber terrorism, hostile cyber activity or cyber war. 
Four, assess the impact of a probable event or events. And five, determine what solutions are available at an industry level to provide cover. And then within each individual commercial firm to determine what the appropriate limits are and how any terms and conditions of coverage should apply based on those policies. Today, I'm going to focus on the first three of those objectives, which you'll see on the slide before you, which will center on clarity of coverage, being able to articulate and to characterize events. Once the industry is able to understand who is responsible and what the type of attack is, it's then possible to provide answers, greater clarity, certainty about the ultimate coverage, who will pay and who will be held accountable. Michael, can we go back a slide, please? Apologies. No problems. Within this context, the Geneva Association arose to the challenge in 2019 and determined to provide thought leadership to the industry. In doing so, we partnered with IFTRIP, the International Forum of Terrorism Reinsurance Pools, to develop the Geneva Association and IFTRIP Cyber Terrorism and Cyber War Task Force. The task force involved more than 50 preeminent leaders across the primary insurance industry, reinsurance industry, and terrorism pools. And this is this spanned every continent globally. The task force has produced or is producing three distinct thought leadership outcomes, which you'll see on the slide below. The first, a report on common language which was published in July 2020 the second on about a report concerning how we can move towards attribution consensus and the third and current report which should be produced in summer of 2020 will be um, a report on the solutions available going forward so that we as an industry can enhance coverage next slide please at the start of today's presentation, there is a challenge in terms of both the status quo that we have for cover, as well as the existing landscape about how we describe it and how we go forward. The present work that the GA has done has undertaken specifically looking at malicious cyber. So if you look at the diagram below, we're in essence concerned only with cyber terrorism right through to cyber war. What the GA did is we focused specifically on the behavior between, between terrorism, cyber terrorism and cyber war. Cyber terrorism is largely insurable in the commercial market with different um, limits available, and cyber war is almost unanimously excluded and or not available in commercial coverage. So it's essentially that gray area between the two that we looked at and what we have termed that is hostile cyber activity. So Michael, next slide please, which is, I believe the poll. It is indeed. Actually, just before we move to the poll, would you mind just briefly explaining what you meant by non-malicious cyber to the audience? Yeah, so in terms of non-malicious cyber is um, cyber criminality, is areas where there is mistakes, um, system failures, et cetera. So malicious cyber activity, terrorism, war, hostility, where there's some kind of malicious act or intention behind the action. Thank you. So uh, we move into the, our first poll. Do you feel existing insurance coverage uses terminology to explain cyber risks that are easily read and understood? by those purchasing policies. I'm launching the poll now, folks. Uh, Rachel, our audience is normally very swift off the buzzers here. Uh, and again, they are. We're 10 seconds in and nearly half have voted. I'll leave the poll open for just a few, uh, maybe another 15 seconds. Well over half of the audience have voted now. And I'm just going to move to close the poll and share the results with everyone. And uh, it would appear that uh, about uh, not quite two thirds of the audience, well, 60% of the audience think the language is opaque and 40% uh, the language is mostly understood with minor clarifications needed. 
So thank you very much, Michael, and thank you to the audience for your answers. Um, in terms of, I guess, the results of the poll, the results suggest that we at least need to continue to work on what we have and or to, um, to create new solutions about terminological clarity. So what I'll do is I'll explain the term hostile cyber activity, which we believe as the GA is, um, is helping to promote that clarity and to move beyond what is mostly understood so that next time that we do a similar poll that um, the answers will be sort of a, a box ahead. So we'll be at minimum mostly understood and or um, entirely clear and, and understood. So in terms of hostile cyber activity, the term hostile cyber activity, um, it sits between cyber terrorism and cyber war. And that's when we think of those terms within the insurance context. So the intent for um, hostile cyber activity is to cause serious damage in another state. And that's regardless of publicity and or the intent to cause terror. So that's one, one area where it differentiates from cyber terrorism. For cyber terrorism, there is that intent requirement or that inquire requirement that there is um, the need to instill fear or terrorism in, in others. There isn't that requirement with hostile cyber activity. Um, in terms of hostile cyber activity as well, hostile cyber activity, it tends to be perpetrated by or, or on behalf of um, with moral support or encouragement by a nation state. Hostile cyber activity, it's not an act of war and it's, it's so it's behaviour that falls less than an act of war. Um, and the, I guess a key thing here in terms of hostile cyber activity is that um, it doesn't matter if we're not able to identify the precise state who was involved. We just need to be able to say that a state was involved, which is massively important because often with cyber events, it is possible to um, prove or to say with a degree of certainty that a state was responsible without being able to narrow it down from a smaller list of possible states that could have been the perpetrator of, of an act. So, and you'll see in the, the diagram below that in the, the blue bar um, highlights in, in essence where I guess the gap that that term seeks to um, provide a narrowing down. Um, we know that there could still potentially be a small amount of gray end, uh, sorry, gray area on either ends of the spectrum, but any potential uncertainty is at least rapidly reduced. So once the term hostile cyber activity has been introduced, it's important to think about how the term not only categorizes the behavior, but also the practical benefits that can be derived from the way in which the term is implemented. So it creates, as I've said before, it creates that new layer, whereby in some instances, if a state is responsible, it's okay if we don't know the exact state which has originated the attack, or even, in some cases, there may be more than one state that is potentially acting. Um, and it also creates a greater, um, a greater way in which we can categorize behavior that would otherwise be not be caught under insurance, existing insurance terminology. Next slide, please, Michael. So the current situation with COVID has drawn even more attention to the fact that um, in not all cases, it's necessary um, to determine the exact actor who is engaged in the activity. Um, rather, it's more important to determine um, what kind of activity it is and what can be done about it where the economic and or the financial protectorate base. And then for us as an insurance industry, as long as we are able to categorise distinctly what the behaviour is, we can then determine as well how we as an industry um, insure or, or don't insure it or at least make informed decisions about that. Importantly, the um, behaviour, which is hostile cyber activity, it can result in either destructive cyber damage 
um, so physical damage and or sufficiently disruptive cyber activity. Because we tend to think of um, often of the physical side of damage, but here it's important to recognize that we're including basically all forms of damage, which is either disruptive and or destructive. Um, it's also less relevant who was the target. So whether someone has suffered damage as a collateral target, or whether they were the main target. Um, and this is particularly important and particularly relevant as the number of vulnerabilities expand and continues to expand, um, particularly as more and more people are online, as more systems are online, and as that um, trajectory of vulnerabilities continues to um, evolve and, and to, I suppose, enlarge going forward. Next slide, please. And we turn here to our second poll, which I'll just launch now. So. Uh... Very straightforwardly, uh, does the term hostile cyber activity effectively narrow the gap between cyber terrorism and cyber war? Uh, yes, it clearly articulates and categorizes the behavior. No, it does little to promote terminological clarity. Yes, it helps to reduce the gray area between different types of malicious cyber activity, but much work must be done in the future to continue to optimize the wording concerning how to describe such behavior. As I said, uh, they're very fast off the mark here, Rachel. So uh, oh, well over half the audience have voted, but I'll leave it open because it's a bit of a long question, a little bit longer. Okay. And now I'm gonna close the poll and share the results, which I think you will find uh, satisfying. <laughs> uh, you can see here that 68% uh, of the audience believe that it does reduce the gray area, but you need a little bit more work. Okay, perfect. So. Uh, thank you to the audience, and uh, I'm glad that the terminology at least goes somewhat in the uh, direction that, that we're seeking. Um, so in our viewpoint on the Geneva Association and, and IFTRIP, um, the categorization of, of cyber activity as potentially hostile cyber activity is part of, or is one piece of the puzzle. But the next piece of the puzzle is being able to um, attribute and or, um, sorry, characterize the behavior. So who was responsible and how can we appropriately allocate responsibility? Next slide, please, Michael. So to explain a bit further, the process of attribution is allocating responsibility for a cyber attack to be connected to an a particular cyber actor and in doing so it's allocating the correct responsibility and who who should be responsible and who should be accountable and they may seem like obvious questions but they're not necessarily um, always obvious questions particularly where it's perhaps a cyber um, terrorist organization that is responsibility sorry that is responsible and or if there's some connectivity to a state what the ramifications for that could and or should be so although the process of attribution and characterization are two separate procedures the process of attribution plays a large part in terms of how to then go on and characterize an event a cyber war cyber terrorism hostile cyber activity or merely as cyber crime so these processes, attribution and characterization, they go hand in hand. Um, and you'll see on the right hand side of, of the slide that it is a convoluted process that involves a number of different um, factors. But it's also a very important well, set of procedures and processes as well, because um, determining who is responsible and therefore as well what kind of act it is will often determine um, if there are any limits or sublimits under policies and um, what is, and, and also going forward, what may be um, covered that isn't currently covered. Um, in terms of commercial policies where we've got um, cyber terror or an act that looks like cyber terrorism, these processes may also be relevant in determining where a commercial pool kicks in, a commercial terrorism pool kicks in or not, if that's envisioned in the cover. 
Rachel, just a quick question from Edwina Morton, who um, mm -hmm. is a former senior journalist and, and actually past master of the world traders. Uh, she would like to know who determines when cyber is an actual act of war. A number of countries have made ambiguous announcements about the use of other weapons as a means of deterrence, including cyber. Uh, is it purely the state that makes this definition or can we do it from the outside? But who, who's making the decision here? So in in our report and from our research, um, if something is war and or cyber war, it's war based on the Geneva Convention. So one, a declared act of war or two, um, an activity that occurs within a warlike situation. So um, it doesn't matter in that instance with both of those examples in mind, whether the act is a boots on the ground war type situation or whether it's partly boots on the ground, partly cyber or whether it's fully cyber. But as far as um, from our research, anything that falls within those two categories is war and or cyber war. Anything that's short of that could be hostile cyber activity. Mm -hmm. And is there an entity, though, that makes this decision or is it left to the insurer and the courts? So at the moment, there isn't a specific entity that, that makes the decision per se. Um, unfortunately or, or fortunately, um, the decision is made insurer by insurer. It's made country by country. It will be influenced by the courts, um, by cultural norms, by existing um, laws within the state in which it's it's applied, as well as any overarching international norms. Um, one of the things which the Geneva Association is um, promulgating is that in the future, we could develop some international norms around the way that attribution and characterization takes place. Um, we do, however, see that this would be a medium to longer term solution. It's not going to be something that realistically we can hope to, to have implemented tomorrow. But I think realistically there is um, scope and there is appetite for, for that to be a longer term um, momentum. Perfect. Um, so if we, sorry, I'm just going to skip a few slides, um, given we had a couple of questions in between. I think some of this material has already been covered. So, Michael, if you could skip to the next slide, please. Yeah. Yeah, this is so, one. yeah so in terms of um, this slide, what, what we're talking about and what is really important when we're referring to um, both hostile um, cyber activity and also the process of um, attribution and characterization is the level of connectivity to a state. So um, at the moment, there's a lot of confusion regarding how much connectivity or how little connectivity is required for a state to be said to be the actor. And we've got everything from a state ignored attack. So a state is perhaps aware that something is happening, but they just sort of um, are silent to it or, or don't actively um, prevent it right through to um, a state integrated or a state executed attack. Within the categorization of hostile cyber activity, um, any of that behavior could potentially be a hostile um, cyber activity as long as there is connection to the state. And that um, in terms of the actual burden of connectivity and, and proving connectiveness, that um, makes it a lot easier to prove that um, there is connection to, to a state. Um, so next slide, please. So in terms of um, one of the outcomes from the, the Geneva Association report number two is what we tried to do is we tried to map out a framework for cyber attribution and cyber characterization. So um, in the slide before you, you've got um, what, what we propose as an illustrative example that could potentially be used by, by insurers. 
So in terms of the first level of both um, characterization, sorry, attribution and characterization, generally this first level is not done in the public domain. So it's done with information that's that's not otherwise available. And it's really to work out, okay, so who is involved and what is this? I mean, generally this will only be done if, if it appears that there is a malicious actor in the first place. Um, once this first stage occurs with information that's, um, you know, perhaps from the police, perhaps from intelligence agencies, for example, um, if it's then determined that this actually does look like it, um, it is either cyber terrorism, hostile cyber activity or cyber war, um, and for example, that this may need to be tested by um, a public forum. So this may, may be because it's um, an exclusion clause is, is called into action or because of terms or conditions of an insurance policy, for example. Generally, the process of attribution and characterization will be carried out a second time. But in terms of the second time that this is carried out, um, this will be done with then publicly available information and the reason it will be done with publicly available information is then um, so that the information can go for example before a court to explain that that is the case um, even where it's done with publicly available information it's not without challenge um, because of course um, every there are challenges for the state um, or where the attribution is is being made um, for political and perhaps economic reasons why they may or may not wish to to name the actor. So on that um, note, and given the fact that I've already um, mentioned the desire to have sort of international norms, I'll now revert back to you, Michael, um, for audience questions. Oh, that's great. We had a couple more polls as well. Did you want to run those now? Quickly? Yes, sorry, we'll run the polls and then uh, audience great. questions. Well, thank you very much for that. So folks, I'm just going to launch uh, two very quick polls uh, just to get the tenor of the audience. Uh, so this first poll um, has now been launched. And asking here uh, very much, should the insurance industry help lead the development of an international norm or uh, or harmonize process for the attribution and characterization of an event. Okay. And well over half the audience voted and pretty overwhelmingly uh, believe at 84% that it is important to get full consistency. Very clear, clear answer there. And I'll now um, launch the second poll, our fourth poll, I should say, really. Uh, who else needs to be at the metaphorical table discussing this? Is it all the insurance companies and the corporate customers, the insurance companies, the security firms, the technology providers, the corporates, or three, the whole world? <laughs> okay, and again, an overwhelming uh, fast vote and an overwhelming consensus. Uh, that it really has to be just about everybody, which I think you kind of expected. Uh, so it's still a kind of a massive consultation problem, isn't it, Rachel? Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's fantastic to see that um, from the poll, there is, I guess, that overwhelming consensus that everyone needs to be involved and that everyone, in essence, needs to be around this metaphorical table. Well, you've been doing a lot of work, and in fact, with a, a, a fellow a guest on our show last year, uh, Julian Enoizzi, um, got a lot of questions here, and uh, folks do get them in quickly, so I have time to feed them into the conversation. Um, I think that probably the, the first question is one from Charles Vermont, uh, and you're taking a sort of a definitional approach, and Charles is a broker in the market, and he's sort of saying, well, surely the answer is an all-risk policy, with underwriters clearly stating which events they are not prepared to cover. In other words, exclusions and standard wording, therefore. What are your thoughts on that? So even if you have exclusions that, that are operational, you still need to be um, absolutely clear and precise 
about what is and what is not covered. Um, and that's something which the industry has been working on and needs to continue to work on, whether they specifically name um, the risk and or the peril and or have an all risks policy and specifically exclude. It's as important to be um, pinpoint precise with what is excluded and therefore the parameters of cover. Uh, Lasse Instafjord Osvag uh, has a there's a crisis with the large grey areas still seen today between armed conflict and conventional war. Two categories that we have thousands of years of experience with. Sadly, how much work can we realistically put into defining cyber attacks before we run into diminishing returns? The key thing is that the industry continues to work together on these. Um, that we're clear that we're all speaking in terms of in this in de describing risks in the same way so that when we're um, talking to each other not about individual policies but in terms of appetite as, as a sorry at an industry level when we then talk to other stakeholders regulators governments brokers etc um, that it's clear that we're all referring at least to the same the same risks broadly and that so that um, we're comparing apples with apples. Uh, Henry Winnan is with Akinova, and I know you're familiar with uh, Akinova. Uh, so what is your view on whether organizations, corporates, other institutions should be forced by law to disclose measures that they are taking to reduce cyber risks and disclose an incident as soon as it happens? In particular, listed corporates or areas, for example, where there's evidence of insider trading. Any comments on that? So I can say with my Geneva Association hat on, we don't have a Geneva Association agreed position. It's not something that we've specifically um, discussed. Um, in, in terms of with my personal hat on, I think uh, there would need to be, um, I guess, more discussion about um, how that was done in practice. Although regulation and, and other um, kinds of measures can be useful if, um, if they are discussed and sort of set out um, clearly and um, it's, it's very clear in terms of their objectives and also how they would be carried out. Um, I think a lot of work would need to be done to make sure that there is that clarity and that what's being asked for um, serves a specific purpose and is, is also very easy and clear to obtain, um, taking into account also the commercial reality and the cost for those that are going to gather this kind of information. Hmm. Very good. Uh, Hugh Purser is curious, presumably some of the actors may act for different parties at different times so themselves criminal sponsors state sponsors for example uh, how does that affect uh, both your categorization and, and attribution yeah so in terms of that we have found that there's often um actors that that are engaged in you know either for themselves and or they for example monetize a um, cyber activity and therefore may be paid by someone else which may or may not be a state um, in what we're looking for in terms of the way that we're categorizing the events is we're looking for example for connectivity to a terrorist organization and or connectivity to a state so the fact that um, an actor may also do this privately because they just decide to at a different time um it's not irrelevant but in terms of the actual event that we're analyzing for that particular event or for that series of ev events was for example a state involved or was there a terrorist organization involved in that particular act yes. or that particular series of acts uh charles uh vermont's come back with um War is normally excluded because it is an overwhelming systemic risk. Uh, mm -hmm. However, in cyber, war and terrorism have the same systemic risk. Do you think there's a, really a need to differentiate? 
so war um, is, in essence, it's unanimously excluded. It's not just cyber war, but war in general, um, with the exception of, I believe, a few um, obscure policies. Um, so a few things, I think, in the marine space and or aviation space, but I won't speak about those because I don't know the specific ins and outs of those policies. But in large, it, it's an excluded risk. Yeah, yeah things like um, the Hellenic War is mutual and things, but they are very specialist, I agree, yeah. Yes, so um, in terms of cyber terrorism, however, there is some appetite and some um, capacity already within the market. So the, the difference with... Um, cyber terrorism is that um, there is potential for systemic losses but to date um, based on capacity and based on past events and projections for future events there isn't the same systemic potential systemic losses as there is for war for example and there's also in terms of war um, as opposed to terrorism terrorism so an act of terrorism usually has more limited resources than, for example, would be um, deployed or would potentially be av available in an instance of war. Okay. Uh, Henry Winand again. Uh, do you think cyber insurance should, and I would add to this, or insurers, uh, should ever pay a bad or potentially bad actor, even if this is allowed by local regulations? or should it only be paid to the target of the attack and considered as business interruption only? I'm thinking here, for example, of you know things um, like, like ransomware um, and things of that nature. So at the moment, there's different um, corporate rules in different localities regarding whether ransomware is or isn't um, paid. There isn't an industry standard position. There isn't a global position on all ransomware payments. In general, um, the insurance industry focuses on their client, on the um, insurer, and therefore how to reduce the losses to them and to ensure that they are up and running as quickly and as easily as possible with minimum overall damage, um, not just now, but in terms of business continuity and in, in terms of longer lasting damage. That should be um, the focus and that should be their key stakeholder. Yeah, it's been, it's been quite tough here in London. There have been a couple of uh, very, very severe cases for reasonably sized firms as well of ransomware and the difficulty of not paying or paying. It's uh, it's still a very unclear area, uh, much like kidnap and ransom of all forms. So, so sad, but true. Um, uh, Peter Lewis uh, would like to know, uh, in your opinion, uh, Rachel, how much interaction is there between the insurance industry and various national security bodies? So the NSA or in the UK, GTAC and GCHQ, JTAC, sorry. So different firms will have a different level of connectivity to, to different um, security agencies. All that I would say is um, from the appetite of the industry, there's a lot of appetite to have as much connectivity as possible. Um, the insurance industry is really quite um, quite active to in, in terms of I suppose, reaching out their arm to understand and to work with national um, law enforcement agencies about what risks exist and about what they can do, um, you know, beyond what they're currently doing. Okay. And finally, in the time available, um, quite quite a complicated one, so I'm glad we've got a couple of minutes to address it. It's also from Henri and went on. Indemnity policies have basis risk when it comes to cyber coverage. Uh, underwriters will only interpret their will only interpret their wordings when there is a disputed claim, and the allocation of responsibility remains difficult. So, as a result, payment timings and quanta can be uncertain. Uh, do you have an opinion? Do you think that simpler parametric insurance uh, might be better 
these also have basis risk when it comes to the trigger selection. So at present, um, I'm not aware of any cyber parametric policies, at least as they operate in relation to malicious cyber activity. Um, I'm not aware of any being in existence and or any even being um, promulgated at the moment. It is something which, um, you know, if designed correctly with um, a number of factors in mind, could have potential going forward. Um, but again, this will be depend on the way that it is designed and the way that it operates in practicality. Now, Rachel, your uh, third report is out sometime in the summer. Not trying to push you on deadline. Uh, do you feel your job is done, uh, or where will you be going after that? So, in terms of the GA, the main thing in the shorter term is to highlight what solutions are available. So, um. What I can, I guess, premise thus far is um, our initial research suggests that there may be some kind of public-private partnership um, that's needed, but the report will outline specifically what we feel um, that that could or might look like. Um, in terms of going forward from there, it will ultimately depend on, um, I suppose, both the appetite of of the industry, whether this is captured. The, um, the the broader community interest and how we need to get involved going forward. Um, I think this is this as as a sort of piece of cyber is something that the insurance industry needs to continue to collaboratively work on. Um, we need to continue to collaborate with um, governments, with regulators, with national security, with tech providers, with um, commercial entities. It's very much um, with cyber and particularly with malicious cyber, a matter of continuing to collaborate, continuing to educate ourselves and continuing to, I suppose, be a stronger force against the um, metaphorical cyber enemy. You might like to comment on uh, my, my thinking of this is in a sense, you've done a piece of analysis and you've, you've pointed out that the terminology needs to be adjusted uh, as you had, particularly on that good slide showing where um, the, the blue element was running underneath three different red ones and that we need this type of clarity. That's great. The next level out, I think, of understanding is within a very small bit of the industry, really, wording specialists and the legal teams, perhaps. You then want to move out into the brokerage community, educating the clients. You'd like to then get out to uh, corporate risk managers, uh, most certainly, uh, and I guess beyond that, uh, you've got the general public, uh, and maybe maybe somewhere in the middle of the courts. That's a huge communications program. Um, mm -hmm. Do you is that something that the Geneva Association feels it will be masterminding and leading, or are you kind of saying we've done the thinking and we would like other people to be picking up the communication? So it's a bit of both. Um, one of the core objectives of the Geneva Association is educating the industry and also um, society in, in general. So we will do what we can to ensure that there is, um, I guess, consistent understanding, not just of malicious cyber activity, but of um, cyber activity in general. But um, we as an industry body cannot do this alone. So we require continued help from our members, from the industry to be able to communicate this. We need um, for clients to think about, um, I guess, how they, what they need and, and to be able to listen to their insurers, to listen to their brokers, for, for brokers to communicate this, and also for communication initiatives in general to the community. So it all felt it sort of filters out and filters back. Great, great. Just sadly, we've come to time, and uh, I, I'm conscious of the, the enormous difference in hours here and there. But it's been really nice to have you on uh, to talk about this very, very important work, and also to catch it at a nice stage, sort of not quite finished. And so we're looking forward to it uh, being completed over the summer. Anyway, I, I'm afraid I have to draw things to a close. Uh, as ever, it's always a little abrupt on these uh, on these uh, webinars. Uh, with three rounds of thanks, if I may, 
And the first round of thanks is as ever to our sponsors. Cyber affects everyone, and I don't think that there'd be a single sponsor who didn't feel that today was an extremely relevant webinar to be hosting. Uh, I'd secondly like to thank the audience. Uh, you've been excellent as ever uh, in a deep and technical subject, and I noticed how many of you st stuck with it right through to the end. Well, I would just point out, as ever, go to the website, but we will be kicking off on Monday with the Financial Centers of the World program at 10 o'clock London time, 11 o'clock on the continent, and we're focusing on Frankfurt. Frankfurt, as many of you will know, uh, sees itself increasingly as a rival to London and has jumped quite significantly in our Global Financial Centers Index. And they will be presenting why they think they've gotten there, but also where they think they're going. And they have some uh, very, very challenging goals that they've set themselves. But my biggest and most sincere thanks has to be to you, Rachel. Um, you, you were great at volunteering to do this, uh, great at sharing it, and great at handling the time zone difference. Uh, we, ha we can hardly wait to see you back in Geneva or in London, which uh, where we used to hang out together quite a bit. Unfortunately, I am unable to open the floodgates of applause, so I have picked an applause meter from uh, somewhere between the two of us. This is my Korean karmic clapper, and that will have to, I'm afraid, substitute uh, for the great enthusiasm of the audience. I've got quite a few thank yous here, which will all be passed on to you. So thank you very much, and we hope to see you again as you develop even further in helping the insurance industry advance. Thank you.